Just Recording. one second. All right. Okay. I'm going to mute my own phone. So watch your language. <laughs> watch it. So welcome and thank you all for joining us for the September Midday Cafe. We are so excited to be with you. And what a privilege we have to learn from our founder of the IEA Great Lakes chapter and one of my favorite comedians, Dr. Jerome Wagner. Um, I think that he has a, a, a career, a secret career as a stand-up comic somewhere that, um, that we have yet to discover. And so I, I'm looking forward to uh, getting some more jokes that I can steal and um, make my own. So thank you so much for the material in advance, Dr. Wagner. Um, my name is Danielle Fanfare. I have the pleasure of serving as your co-president of the IEA Great Lakes chapter, along with my uh, co-president, my friend Tor, and my teacher, Reverend Claire Lorish. Thank you so much for inviting me into this privilege and opportunity. I wanna share a couple of announcements before we get into the meat, or in my case, I'm plant-based, so before we get into the tofu of our midday cafe, you know, um, we want to make sure that everybody knows all of the opportunities to study, to deepen, and to learn, and to help other folks deepen in their understanding of the Enneagram. So if you don't already follow us on our social media pages, we want to make sure you know that we have an Instagram and a Facebook page. I'll be dropping the links to those pages in our chat. Please, um, oh, Leanne, I will not be able to be on camera for very long, but I'll be listening. All right, Leanne, I love that. Thank you so much. So I'm going to drop the links to those pages in our chat. Please follow our um, social media channels and post, contribute, share from there as well. We also have a YouTube channel where if you miss a Midday Cafe or you want someone that you love to hear the gems and the deeper understanding that is being dropped every time we gather, that link is there for you. Lastly, if you want to sign up for our newsletter, I wanna invite you to please sign up for our newsletter by emailing us at the IEA Great Lakes Region at gmail.com. Sign up, we, do, we won't spam you, but we will give you some gentle reminders to help you remember all the things that we got going on. Now, one of the beautiful parts of our newsletter is that in that newsletter are opportunities for learning. So we have some amazing opportunities to become certified and accredited from some of the teachers that we have with us today. And so we have the um, Enneagram, I Enneagram Motions of the Soul Training and Certification with the Harmony Triads with Reverend Claire Lowridge. I'm telling y'all, those Harmony Triads will change how you see yourself, how you see your world and how you see other people. And then I also have attended the Enneagram Spectrum Training and Certification Part One with Dr. Wagner. Got a great understanding. And I love how Dr. Wagner harmonizes psychology and proven behavioral psychological study with the Enneagram. And so he brings that science in there so that everybody knows that we know what we're talking about. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I would uh, please join the uh, the newsletter and I'm gonna drop the links for those trainings. I also have a training. I run a Confusion to Clarity curriculum here from Houston, Texas, and that training is available as well. So we'll drop those links. And then the other thing is we have some amazing workshops and events coming up. The Be Yourself Retreat is a hybrid workshop with the um, spiritual rhythms for the Enneagram as the curriculum with Reverend Claire Lowers. And it is a pay what you can, pay what you like investment. I love those because they make it so accessible. So if you know someone who really wants to study the Enneagram, who wants to learn from a legend and who wants to be able to dictate what they invest from their budget, that's a great one to um, refer them to and to attend with them. The I'm teaching an Enneagram masterclass on October the 6th, as well as BFF training. And so we'll be dropping those links in the chat as well. I think that's it. Also keep your, your mics on mute until we get to the question portion. This meeting is being recorded for quality assurance. <laughs> and so we assure quality and we want everybody to have a great time. So with that, I am going to give it to you, Claire, and check out the chat for some links to those events and those certifications. Dropping them right now. 
Thanks so much, Danielle. Isn't she a pleasure? I mean, I just, I could just listen to you all day long. And, um, and I just want to say welcome, everybody. I, I really love seeing uh, all your faces and, and knowing that your brilliant IQ, EQ, and GQ is going to be present in this training and all the ways that you want to ask Dr. Wagner questions. And so, you know, I, this is a man who needs no introduction. However, I'll do it anyway. Uh, you know, Dr. Wagner is a clinical psychologist, psychotherapist, supervisor, consultant in private practice, and formerly a, uh, a part of the Institute of Pastoral Studies at Loyola University Chicago in the Department of Psychology. So if you haven't read Nine Lenses, you just, you got to go out and get it. And if you've never taken Dr. Wagner's inventory, um, it really truly is one of those, uh, one of the tests, because of course Burroughs uh, identifies it as legit. Um, but you can see in the percentiles what you have in your cupboards, like how much of the one do I have? How much of the two do I have? And where are the, you know, where are my uh, less resourceful and resourceful energies coming from? So while there are a lot of people in my, um, in my profession as a spiritual director slash pastor and learner um, who would say, we don't teach the Enneagram through this testing thing. It's all about the narrative or the oral tradition. And I would say, absolutely, the narrative and the oral tradition are uh, I premier in understanding the Enneagram. But along with that, if you can have just a little tool that helps you take a look at things, that, that test is, uh, or inventory, I like that better test. I don't like tests because I'm a three and I don't want to fail. So I'd rather know what the, you know, how many, how, how much of the nine I have in my, in my cupboard. Um, so Dr. Wagner really was, if you don't know this, and for those of you joining us later on YouTube, Dr. Wagner was one of the people who learned the Enneagram, one of the first students of the Enneagram uh, in the West. And what we know is that he has, um, through the Institute of Integrative Analysis at Loyola, he's brought us uh, the best of the best teachers from all of the modes of Enneagram training. He's one of the most humble human beings, actually receiving from all the schools long before it was vogue to do so. He was willing to let everybody come in and bring their research um, at, so that we could receive the best of the best uh, in Enneagram training. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, my teacher, my friend, my colleague, my, uh, you know, the person when I grow up, I want to be just like him, um, Dr. Jerome Wagner. So everybody, let's welcome Jerry. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're thinking about transgendering yourself, are you? I, <laughs> very interesting news, but good for you. Uh, yes, I thank you for your kind remarks. I plagiarized from the best. So I, you know, and also I do not approve of anything I have to say today. So while this is being recorded, I just want to make that caveat. So thank you all for coming. And um, uh, so I want to talk about... <laughs> Uh, you stress and distress. Uh, I was just thinking earlier, you know, who's not distressed for God's sake, you know, the world is coming to an end. We got floods, we got fires, we got uh, wars, we got uh, politics. Um, so it, you know, it's distressing. So it got me thinking about, well, how, how have the nine types managed to survive. It's like mother nature evolution has evolved these nine styles and they all have ways of um, surviving, contributing to the community. So, you know, what, what makes each type resilient? And I'm thinking, well, how, how can we tap into some of that? Um, I also have, uh, I've, I've done a little seven number on the defense mechanism. So let me, at the end, you know, talk a little bit about, well, what's good about defenses? You know, they all seem to be kind of bad, but what the hell, they they help us to survive. So what's good about them? All right, I'm going to share my screen because I'm basically shy and I don't want you to see me. It's better to see than to be seen. That's my motto. All right, so here's this chart. 
And um, it, I, I wrote an article, it's on my website, uh, uh, enneagramspectrum.com. But this is the um, uh, chart that demonstrates the optimal level of arousal. And it sounds more titillating than it really is. It's just an optimal level of excitement. And if you get up to this level, now you're at the top of your game, you're kind of in a flow state and you're doing things really well. Uh, if you don't get up to that level, then you're kind of um, slowing down, you're a little bored, you're apathetic, or you're falling asleep. And so you, if you're here and you're not too excited, and I hope you're getting more and more excited the more I talk here, now we're getting up to the optimal level of arousal. So you're really taking this in and saying, man, this is fabulous stuff. But if you get too excited, and I have to say, calm down, take it easy, take a deep breath, because if you get too excited, then you get scattered mentally, you know, and you start to shake and your, you know, your behavior is not so good. And so you start to get anxious. And the end result of that is panic. So you don't want too little energy. You don't want too much energy. You want just the right amount. So I'm thinking then, okay, <clears throat> this is you stress, good stress. It's like uh, Congressman John Lewis talked about good trouble. So this is good stress, and it, it, it helps us to perform well at our best. So what is it that each type does to get themselves up to this level? And then what do they do to either not get up there or overdo it? You know, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. So, so how, and the other thing I was thinking about was there's some suffering that's necessary. So as human beings, sad to say, hard, I don't want to tell sevens this, but we are going to suffer. Um, so if you love someone and they die, you suffer, you experience grief. It's the price you pay for loving. If you get older, price you pay for getting older is that things start to break down and it takes you longer to get out of bed in the morning. So it's necessary suffering. It's the price we pay for being human. There's some unnecessary suffering. We bring it on ourselves. <clears throat> so how does each the nine types make themselves suffer when they really don't have to? So kind of a unnecessary suffering. And I think mostly it's because we just overdo our strengths are are good things so having said all that let me close this and because you have been very good and attentive let me put up another one you can never have enough slides it's my motto i'm just gonna do this keep it simple all right <clears throat> inner and outer team. So um, I think if I make this bigger, it's going to mess it up. Let me just see. Yeah, never mind. Okay, so we got the inner and outer team. Um, <clears throat> the, according to the Enneagram, we got nine players <clears throat> on our outer team. And so, uh, you know, it's like you've got an inner board of directors and you, uh, your main style is the CEO, the chief operating officer, the chief executive officer. But then you've got eight assistants in there <clears throat> that you can consult. Well, how should I think about this? What should I do about this? So we've got these nine inner players. We tend to play the ones that we know the best. And so on my Enneagram test, you know, take a look at your high scores. And those are probably the, the parts of yourself that you put in the game the most. Low scores, maybe not so much. Uh, so I'm, I'm high on five. I'm low on eight. And, you know, I'm, God knows what will happen if I put that eight in the game. You know, he'll probably create mayhem. So I keep him on the sidelines. Um, perhaps I should let him practice it a little bit. Might be some good things about being assertive. Oh, and one other thing, we've got a new thing coming for the Enneagram test, uh, just to, to promote it here. We found that 97% of the people who take the test, or probably any Enneagram test, identify with their top three scores. 
So right now you take the uh, Webbs Wagner test and you get a printout for the top score. We now have it and it's going to be online pretty soon. And even if you've taken it, you can still do this magic trick. You can click a button and see what it looks like if your second highest score is the highest one. So you get a whole new printout or click another one and you can see what your third highest score looks like. Like you get three horoscopes for the price of one. It's fabulous. So that covers 97% of the people who, who take the test. The other 3%, too bad. <sighs> go to the... Uh, Go to the narrative tradition, let somebody interview. And they'll say, well, we don't know what the hell you are either. Oh, my language, be careful. Okay, so we got these nine players. So what is it that helps ones thrive, survive? What makes them resilient? And I think one of the things is their idealism. So you think about this too. Um, I, it, it's a, it's a, it causes suffering because they're always disappointed if you're an idealist. On the other hand, it kind of gives you hope. We'll talk about that when we get to the threes and the sevens. But there's something about idealism that's resilient. And uh, there's something about doing the right thing. Uh, uh, surprisingly enough, I was just reading a, a thing about Bill Clinton, who said in the evening, if he thinks back over the day and thinks he did something right, did the right thing, he feels good about himself. So there's something about doing the right thing that's that's resilient. Also, there's something about righteousness boy, that's good. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. I forgot who, where Paul said that or whoever said that. Um, again, I plagiarized from the best. Um, there's something about righteousness that that gives us strength. We can stand in the face of adversity knowing I'm right. It's going to kill me, might kill you, but by God, we're right. It's 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 a source of resilience. And also, what what gets ones up? What gets them ready for the game? Wanting to do things well. That passion for excellence seems to me is something that um, <clears throat> um, creates energy and excitement in the one. And so they they it keeps them going. Yes, I want to do this well. And if you think about the rare times when you did something well, my guess is you felt really good about yourself. And you felt good about what you did. Ah, yes, that was really a good pie I made. That was a good piece of music I played. That was a good article I wrote. Whatever it was that you did. Um, it's, it's, it's internally rewarding to do something well. Now, so you could ask yourself, the inner team player, when you're consulting your board of directors, what would your better self do in this situation? It's the right thing to do. So if you're looking for uh, discernment, What's the right thing to do? Now, what happens? How do you go from uh, optimal level of arousal and excitement to um, unnecessary suffering? You just do too much of the same thing. So instead of wanting to do something well, you have to do it perfectly. So now the one just pushes it too far and they create unnecessary stress, distress. How do you distress yourself Try to be perfect about everything you do. Try to get your inner critic uh, talking as loud as possible and as much as possible. So just up the ante and you go from uh, um, resiliency and you stress to a state of distress. So it's going to happen with all the types. You just do too much of a good thing. And um, your shoulds then kind of... Well, either to do two things. They might drop you down to, oh, hell, I give up. I'm not even going to bother trying. That'd be the one going to the four. Uh, or mm, you you get so panicky that you just, you it messes up your good game. So the better becomes the enemy of the good. Okay, what about twos? He says, 
And think about for your in your own miserable life, how does some of this play out? You know, when you've done the right thing, when you let your better self enter, you know, when you're when you become the adult in the room, how has that been for you? How can you do that more? All right. So the two, um, what makes twos resilient? I think it's love. You know, love makes the world go round. It it love gives meaning to our life. Love um, makes our life worthwhile. And love in the face of adversity, in the face of evil, is resilient. It doesn't give in. It doesn't back off. Stands there. And um, Mother Nature said, okay, human beings started to have children. Uh, and in, instead of, you know, snakes and, and turtles and all that, we take care of our children, as the mammals do. So now you need this empathy. And that's a particularly human uh, quality. And so empathy is good for the person. It's good for other people. And, and so that makes twos resilient. What also makes twos resilient is they value relationships. Mother Nature figured out that we survive better <clears throat> in groups than on our own. Fies might disagree with that, but it seems to be the case. Now, the problem that is, if you overdo it, now you got us versus them. And that's playing out these days. So um, <clears throat> my group is good. Your group is bad. I got to either convert you or kill you, get you into my group. If, if we stop that idea and say we're all in the same boat together, we're all in the same group. <clears throat> now you've got the high side of the two, love. Twos are also very adaptable. There's, you know, pleasing other people, not an entirely bad thing. Uh, so ad adaptation, the ego psychologists say, <clears throat> is the best thing an ego can do. It's how we survive. So how do you go from you stress, twos like to give, they are naturally generous, it gives them energy. It's an it's an internally reinforcing thing to do for twos and for other people. It's good to give. Well, overdo it. Just forget that you also need to get. Allow other people to give. And you're going to distress yourself if you get too helpful, if you say yes too often, until you, you're going to burn out. The lethal combination of giving, 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 and not allowing yourself to receive. So, you know, burn out now. So now the two uh, overdoes a good thing and experiences distress. And if they push it far enough, now they get really <laughs> resentful because, by God, you don't appreciate what they're doing very much. You never ask them to do it in the first place, but that, that doesn't matter. You should be appreciative of all that I've done for you. So now they're experiencing stress again. All right. Threes. What makes threes resilient? Um, I think part of it is, is well, self-efficacy. I can do it. So Bandura is a psychologist, and he talks about self-efficacy uh, being a sign of health. I can do this. Um, confidence competence all these things are kind of good uh <laughs> to have industry erickson erickson talks about industry versus inferiority being able to begin a project bring it to completion that's what threes like to do uh, working with others to bring a project to completion <clears throat> so you learn how to do that in grade school maybe uh or or learn never to do it again by the time you got out of grade school so there's something about the threes, optimism, like a seven, their uh, positive expectations, this is going to work, and, and hope is the, is the divine idea for the three, hope. Seven's got it, three's got it, we all need it, faith, hope, and love. Sixes bring in the faith. 
Um, so Viktor Frankl uh, discovered when he was in the concentration camp that people who gave up hope were dead the next day. It's like the, in the evening they said, you know, we're never going to get out of here. Our life, you know, we're going to die here or, you know, we just work ourselves to death. I give up. And so they did. They died. People who had hope kept living. The children in the Romanian orphanages who were basically neglected died much sooner than they should have as a, as a little child. So without hope, um, we're not doing so good. So that is a source of resilience that we could all draw on. Uh, so what happens at, at, with threes? They, they overdo their working. It's good to keep moving. It's good to be productive. There's, you know, somebody asked Freud, well, what are the qualities of a healthy person? And he said, well, they, they can love and they can work. Somebody else added a little later and they can also play. That's a good thing to remember. So uh, someone who can work and love is called the productive person. So you can ask yourself in a situation, what would my efficient, resourceful, competent self do in this situation? I can do it. How am I going to do it? So um, if you overdo the doing part, then you get the stress in the three. So now you go from being effective to a workaholic. Not so good. And so the overworking creates distress. And if you overwork the personality, so as you know, Don Rizzo and Russ Hudson, <laughs> their line is the personality is what shows up when you don't. Or, you know, we have a personality, but we're not our personality. So you overdo the personality thing. <clears throat> and and that becomes distressful because it's only a part of who you are. You, know, you don't you're not bringing your whole self into the situation. Okay, and it's pretty distressful thinking, man. The only way you're going to like me is if I win a lot of prizes and bring home some trophies, and if I'm successful, that's distressing. Or if I have to stay popular, well, what's popular these days? Now, Eric Fromm talks about the marketing personality. And so you got to put yourself on the market, sell yourself. And you're like a handbag, you know, but fashions change. <clears throat> so you have to keep up with what the market is buying these days. And that's kind of distressful for your real self. Well, who, did, who am I supposed to be now? Okay. What makes fours resilient? So fours, um, authenticity is important. So I'm just thinking about this. So they are they are the authors of their own creations or of themselves. So they're kind of co-creating with God. So they create themselves. They create their 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 works. Um, they're original. They're unique. So they remind us and that, yeah, we're like everybody else. You know, we all need oxygen. We all need sleep. We all need uh, proteins and all this uh, as human beings. We're like some other people. <clears throat> you know, some of us are tall. Some are short. Some are uh, uh, were brown hair or blonde hair. Or some of us are German. Some of us are Irish. You know, so we're like some other people. Like, you know, like sixes or like twos. And we're also like no one else. We are unique. So some schools of personality push that all port. We are each person is unique. Fours would say, yeah, so we've been trying to tell you. Nobody is the same. We're all like those snowflakes. So creative. There's something healthy about being creative. And there's something good about beauty. So the human psyche gets sick if it's in an ugly environment. And beauty 
gives us life. So it brings us up to that optimal level of arousal. So beauty is inspiring. Um, finding meaning, fours like to do that. Finding the meaning in your life, meaning in your suffering, that helps you survive. That's being a source of resilience. And I was thinking too, the capacity to suffer. Fours have a capacity to suffer. And we're all gonna suffer. <clears throat> so we might as well learn how to do it. <laughs> How do you go from eustress to distress? Well, you suffer too much. Uh, it's good to think about death, but not all the time. There's a, a book, um, Staring at the Sun, uh, whose name I can't remember right now, but it's a great image. You can think, you can only stare at the sun for so long, then you got to avert your eyes. You can only think about some of these existential things, you know, like meaninglessness, isolation, death. You can only think about it for some time. Fours kind of overdo the stay in that area. And if you push the uniqueness, if you have to be special in order to be somebody, because if you're like everybody else, you're nobody, that's stressful. You got to be, you know, a little bit mysterious. You got to keep that going. So again, if you overdo a good thing, it becomes a distressful thing. So where is beauty in your life? And if you have to make a decision, if you have to you're in a relationship with somebody, what would your authentic self do? So ones are saying, you know, what's your better self? Two is what's your loving self? Three is what's your effective self, your competent self? Here's what would your authentic self do? All right, fives. Um, what makes fives resilient or what also what gets fives up to that optimal level of arousal uh, learning connecting the dots understanding how things work uh, uh, for fives the, the passions of the mind which really seems kind of pathetic if that's where your passions are but for a five yeah exactly that turns me on. Well, put the book down and calm down. Okay. So you're asking yourself, what does my wise mind do? So the wise mind is the observing ego, the fair witness. We've all got it. So it's the capacity to detach, to step back, to see what's going on, to get the big picture, to um, be objective. Good thing. Helps you to survive. Um, the mystics would say there's something to be said for silence. Extroverts are probably would disagree with that, but uh, silence is, you know, don't speak unless you could improve upon silence, <clears throat> say the Quakers. Uh, there's so there's something resilient about. Um, well, a combination of your um, rational mind, your feeling mind. That's the wise mind. What's the wise thing to do? Or what's the truthful thing to do? So twos are attracted to love. Ones to goodness. Fours to um, beauty. Threes to uh, um, creativity and accomplishing things. Four, fives are kind of looking, what's the truth? What's real here? As someone said, there is no God but reality. All right. So how do you bring on distress? Overdo it. Overthink. Uh, Overdetach. You know, hide out in your cave. It's distressful in there because it gets kind of cold and damp and, you know, you run out of food and it's just boring in that cave. And uh, be being uh, alone and isolated is distressing. Not a good thing. So get out. I get out of my house maybe once a month. That's enough. So um, what else is distressful? Mm, having to always completely know what you're going to do. So you spend a lot of time consumer reports and, and searching the internet. Then you go to the store and they don't have that product anyway. So you just buy whatever the hell they got. But overdoing having to know 
becomes distressful. Little knowing is good, a little spontaneity also good. All right, sixes. Uh, sixes value safety and security, and man, we can use them these days, just about anywhere. So um, what do sixes have? They, they have faith. They are faithful people, faith, hope, and love. They are, um, they value commitment. They value fidelity, keeping your word, doing what you say you're going to do. Uh, they are caring in the sense that they are full of care. They're careful. Be careful. So do no harm. Probably sixes came up with that line for physicians. Um, they value the group. They remember, ah, we do better with our fellows than all by ourselves. So it's important to be a, a good group member. And you can do that by being faithful, by doing your duty. Um, I just gave a, a, a workshop yesterday and, and the leader of the group was, uh, was um, um, from India. It was talking about Hinduism, which I don't know that much about. But apparently, uh, doing your duty is a is a key component of that approach to life. And a Kant, the German philosopher, said, "You know, doing your duty is the highest function a human being can perform. So, do what you're told. Do what you're supposed to do." Sounds pretty dramatic. Uh, how, um, the other thing is the law. The law will keep you safe. So get the law out there in front of you. So it could be righteousness. It could be love. It could be competence. It could be creativity. It could be, um, what, do you, what do fives put out in front of us? Understanding, knowledge. For, for sixes, it's the law. So keep your lawyer on speed dial. Um, the law will protect you. That's what it's there for. It's there to keep you safe, keep us in line. Okay, if you overdo it, you're creating distress. You make the world more dangerous than it really is. You see monsters in the basement where it, I'm sorry, that's just a shadow from the bush outside. I don't know, it could be a monster. No, just a shadow. So you overdo um, danger and you overdo having to be prepared. You have... Uh, 27 exit plans where you really only need maybe one or two. And you overdo <clears throat> being careful and being cautious, and now you really limit yourself. So you, like the fives, are going to stay within the castle, pull up the drawbridge, and don't let anybody in. Especially people who are offering you horses. Hmm. Wait a minute. What's inside that horse? Sevens, on the other hand, would drop the drawbridge and say, oh, here's some horses. Bring them in. That's the best. I love horses. Sixes, beware of horses. All right. So what would your courageous self do in this situation? Wasn't it Eleanor Roosevelt who said, do, like, do one courageous thing each day? Something like that. Or if you're afraid, do it anyway. All right, sevens. Uh, again, hope. Hope is a very resilient thing. Optimism, very resilient. It's going to work out. There's a buoyancy in sevens. Yeah, um, you know, bounce back up. So there's something about enjoyment. If you don't enjoy yourself, why are you doing it? So joy is a good quality for human beings. It makes us resilient, as is wonder. Wow, that's interesting. Isn't that wonderful? It's like sevens want to make the world a more wonderful place. Sixes want to make it safer. Um, uh, so um, finding the good in things is a very resilient thing for sevens. So you can ask yourself, well, 
What does my imagined self do in this situation? What's the heuristic thing to do? So heuristic in, in hypotheses is it, it leads to more hypotheses. So it creates options. So if I have to make a choice, what's going to maximize the options that I have here? That's a, that's, that's a good thing. Can become a bad thing because now you've got all these options. Now what do I do? Which one do I choose? But but cre so if you have only one option, you're stuck. If you have two options, you've got a conflict. If you have three options, you have a choice. So generating options, good thing. What will create the most freedom? Hmm. So I think I think sevens will would promote freedom. There's something good about that. Uh, oh, okay, so that's that gets sevens up. They like to plan. They like to enjoy things. They like to have new experiences. They like new adventures. That gets their optimal level of arousal up. And if they, you know, aren't there, then they plan some more things to do to get themselves up there excited. What happens if you overdo a good thing? It, that's all you know that now creates distress i always have to be up i always have to find the good in things i always have to soar around i always have to entertain people be the life of the party my worth <clears throat> uh, my survival depends on my being able to entertain people and cheer them up get them up a bunch of boring people i'm stuck with you know I used the line, somebody once said, you know, living with her husband was like walking through the woods with a log tied to your leg. I think that's how sevens feel with the rest of us. Oh, for God's sake. Do I have to drag you to this party? Come on. So overdoing, um, avoiding pain, avoiding suffering, avoiding the dark side of life, avoiding desolation for the sake of consolation, ironically, sevens miss out on things. You can say, yeah, I don't mind missing out on that, but perhaps there's something beneficial about winter, about dark, about cold, about quiet. But sevens will never experience that if they're off, if they're trying to avoid it, like the plague. So again, overdoing what brings you to the top of your game, if you push it too far, starts to bring you down and you start to get anxious and distressed. So eights. Strength. Uh, what makes eights resilient? I think it's partly the strength of will. I can do this. Um, willpower. <laughs> luckily you can't see me but i i could afford to lose about 50 pounds you know but what's keeping me from doing that willpower mm, my head you know uh, oh man look at that ice cream mm, look at that hamburger uh, don't look at it look away all right so mm, i can do this that's the uh, motto of the eight i can and i will uh, or I won't. That's also a, a source of strength for the eights. No, I won't do that. So if you say to yourself, I can't do it, change that to I won't do it. I won't do it until, you know, these circumstances are met. That gives you control of the situation. And eights love to be in control. Even more, they don't want to be controlled. So they kind of say that more. Justice is important for the eights. So justice gives you a lot of strength if you're doing the just thing. I have justice on my side, not only the law. So you would ask yourself, what is the fair thing to do here? What's the just thing to do? What does justice require as well as love, as well as goodness? And eights, if you think about power, it's the capacity to influence, to move something through space. So what will influence the greatest movement? What will give me some leverage? <laughs> what, 
what's the offer I can make you uh, that you won't be able to refuse? Uh, so what, you know, what, what, what can I do to influence the situation? All right, nines. Nines are saying, God, finally, it's taking you so long. What makes nines, res oh, uh, back to the eights. Sorry, nines. You overdo a good thing. So the eights are called the over justice maker. So you got to now fight for every cause that there is. Mm -mm, I got to die in every ditch I come across. Let it go. So um, overdo the strength. You, you move from being assertive to being aggressive. Now you're kind of bossy and bullyish. Uh, so you're kind of forcing people to do your way. But in order to not be weak, in order to not be vulnerable, in order to be not taken advantage of, <clears throat> you got to really toughen up and that can cause some stress. The other stress is you, you're, not, you're not allowed to ask for help, you know, because then you'd be weak, just like twos. So that's a way of creating stress in your life. Um, your ego is trying to help you sur to survive, but it's also putting blocks in the way. It's making it hard for you to survive, You're trying to do it alone. Okay, nines. Back to the nines, finally. Mm, nines are <clears throat> patient. They're seeing and looking for the unity in all things to you know reduce the conflict um you know let the wheels move together harmoniously um so they're looking for the one in the many and a peace peace is uh, augustine said that the tranquility of order so the mind likes order uh we don't like disorder that's why i stay out of my basement so what would your peaceful self do in this situation. Uh, what is the most integrating, taking into account all the different parts of myself, all the different parts of the group? Uh, what's the most inclusive thing to do? So nines are inclusive, they're not exclusive. There's room for everybody here. <clears throat> they probably created the pantheon. Yeah, we'll go conquer this country and bring in the gods, put them in the pantheon. There's room for all of them here. Nines are very adaptable, like threes and twos. Adaptation is an ego strength. Um, they can over-adapt, go along to get along. That creates stress. But they're, they're patient. All will be well. How do you create distress? Uh, avoiding conflict too much. <clears throat> uh, waiting for something to happen so you can get too passive instead of being the author. Well, okay, I got to do it. I'm waiting for my ship to come in. Well, swim out to the ship. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, I don't know. It's like the, the judging and perceiving on the Myers-Briggs. I make this up as I go along here. The perceiving side is I'm, I'm going to wait and see what my destiny is. <clears throat> so if I collect enough data, if I wait long enough, I'll know what decision to make, or it'll make itself to be even better. I'll wake up in the morning and I'll know what I need to do. On the judging side, they're saying, I don't think so. <clears throat> you know, you got to make a decision. Enough collecting data, just make a choice and do it. So I think nines tend to be perceiving on the Myers-Briggs, not, not exclusively, but they tend to lean that way. Uh, let's allow things to happen <clears throat> at their own pace, in their own time, as opposed to, you know, at other types like the one, do it now, get it done. So the poor nines are in between two go-getters, the eights and the, nine, and the ones, calm down, take it easy. Relax. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I have a cartoon. I don't have it here, but <laughs> there's a guy <clears throat> sitting in the doctor's office on the examining table, <clears throat> and he's got a cigarette in his mouth, and the doctor is saying, maybe you should relax less. <clears throat> so that would be good advice for the nines. Relax a little less. 
uh, okay. Or maybe you're distracting yourself. Rome is burning. You're playing your fiddle. By the way, do you notice your house is on fire? Yeah, I, I, I know. But let me just finish this uh, book here for a minute. So, so the question is, what would your peaceful self do in this situation? And if you want to create distress, overdo being um, passive, peaceful. All right, uh, because if you ask me questions and I don't have the answers, I'll feel bad. I want to talk about one other thing because I'm thinking about it. And so, of course, you would be interested in this. Stop sharing. I want to talk about the defenses. And it's, it's, it's a, a seven way of thinking about the defense mechanisms. So real quick, the defense mechanism for the, and again, resilience. What's going to help us survive, get through life? Well, try reaction formation. They say, oh, that's a bad thing to do, you know. Mm, but actually, it's a spiritual tradition, Adre Contra, do the opposite. You're attempted to have that second glass of scotch, do the opposite. Have only one glass, or even better, have a glass of water. I choke even thinking about such a thing, but do the opposite. It's it's can be a good thing to do. Uh, you're tempted to smoke that cigarette, uh, go for a walk. So uh, you're <laughs> you're tempted to exercise. Don't lay down until the temptation goes away. Actually, do the exercise. So do it. Something to be said for doing. If you're tempted to meditate less, meditate longer. Twos, repression. You say, well, that seems like a bad thing. Well, think about suppression. So now you're consciously letting something go. So you're mad at somebody, let it go. And if you push it even farther, maybe you get to forgiveness. So the, the positive side of repression is um, don't hang on to it. Let it go. So three is identification. So you got to identify with, what, you know, how should I look? What's working? What's on the market these days? And um, what's good about that is you find what's working, which helps you achieve your goals, get what you want. There's something to be said about being adaptable. And that's the identification. Uh in contrast to, you know, most IT people, you know, if it's working, don't fix it. They would say, well, it's working, so let's fix it. And so now your computer is screwed up for the next two months. Minute? All right. Identification. What works? Fours. Introjection. That seems like a bad idea. Introjection is you interject the bad object. So you take in uh, all the things that your mother and father did to hurt you. And now you hurt yourself. Well, you can also interject a good object. So interject, take in positive influences in your life. It's like Milton Erickson said, my voice will go with you. Carry the voice of your therapist around with you or with anybody who has any sense. All right. So take in a good object. Fives, compartmentalization. You see, that one sounds like a bad idea. But it might it might be a, an antidote to an enmeshed family or situation. So Fies would tend to emphasize the autonomy part of autonomy and community. So the uh, solution would be to be a self in relationship. Hang on to both. Find yourself in the other rather than lose yourself in the other. The isolation where you push down feelings and just have your thoughts might be a good idea uh, in a situation where you are getting overwhelmed by your feelings, and so you need to be more rational. So go to your um, uh, frontal cortex and not your um, amygdala. Could be helpful. Six is projection. You say, "Well, that's a bad idea. You're, you know, you're projecting all your bad stuff onto us." Well, if you want to find yourself, you can either go in and introspect, or you can project 
and then you find yourself outside yourself. <laughs> you look around, who do you like, who do you not like, and follow that back to those qualities in yourself. So projection is a way of getting to know yourself. Seven, sublimation. Uh, uh, Freud would say that's the highest of the defense mechanisms. It's still a defense. It's still, you know, distorting things, but it, less than all the other ones. But so sublimation, though, is you use your instincts in the service of the community. So that's that's the good thing. Uh, you go to your higher self, <clears throat> your better self, or you you find the good sublimation in, in what's going on. So it can be a, a it can be a, a good thing. Denial is the defense mechanism of the eight. You say, well, that sounds bad. You know, that's what alcoholics do. I don't have a drinking problem. <clears throat> well, you, you say that as you're lying on the floor in the living room. Well, when is denial good? In the service of action, it can be good. It's like we'll get through this. It doesn't look like there's any way out, but by God, we'll do it. Uh, we're gonna win. Uh, we're in pain. I mean, the body even, we're going to see narcotization, but even the body uh, creates morphine for us so that we don't feel the pain in order to survive or to get out of the situation. So there might be some times when denial is a good thing. And narcotization. Well, like nines, you just numb yourself out. That's not a good thing. Well, it might be a good thing if you need to numb your pain to keep going. So a lot of people say, I didn't realize my there was this cut on my leg or I had a broken ankle. I just had to get away from that bear. So the body not, automatically numbs itself. Or, and again, I'm being very sevenish here, perhaps you would want to numb yourself to all those defeating voices that are in your brain. Quiet them down lower the uh, volume, put them farther away. Instead of having that voice right in your ear criticizing you, put it away, uh, numb it down. So there are times perhaps when you can use narcotization to your advantage. Defenses, they're there to help us to survive. So um, maybe we can use them for good. All right. I've run out of time. I've run out of pages. I've run out of ideas. <laughs> we we it's it, we're we're at the end of the show here. Anybody can we ask a question or anybody have a question? It's like this is all recorded. I've said many many brilliant things. You can listen to them. Uh, I re I wrote this up. It's on the Enneagram Spectrum website. And I think I'm, I'm going to inspire myself. I think I might give this talk at the IEA conference out in California next year. Or I might Beautiful. not, What depending on how much the airline <laughs> tickets are. Maybe I'll yeah. just, maybe I'll just zoom it in. <laughs> so, so Jerry, this is great. And of course, we always know it's going to be fire hose and a teacup and those that need to leave us we, we are so glad you were with us. And those who can stay for a couple of questions, I think would be yeah. great as long as, as long as Dr. Wagner can uh, stay. And whenever he's done with us, he'll just hit off and we'll all go away. But um, I did, I was, <laughs> I, I was trying to stay ahead of you as the student who learned defense mechanisms from you. Yeah. And I accidentally, but I don't think so. And I wonder, I wrote rationalization uh, for the seven, not sublimation. So tell me okay. about that because it seems like we talked about rationalization with the sevens at other times, but yeah. say, say more. Well, I, I, when I first learned the Enneagram, which is you know in the middle ages, uh, I think sublimation was the uh, defense mechanism Bob Oaks used, but he got it from Claudio Nerano. And I'm not sure where, who changed that, if Claudio did it or, you know, so rationalization, I don't know if that's a form of sublimation. Sublimation is just kind of, um, um, looking for the good in things. I mean, the example is, is what's his name? Um, 
oh shoot the um the old uh, tune in drop out turn on guy um he said he was looking forward to there's apparently a time when you die between when your body dies and your brain kind of shuts down there's there's like there's a few seconds of consciousness there and he was saying i'm really looking forward to that it's like this is the last experience i'm ever going to have so it's it's sublimation meaning you know death is not a good thing but he's saying oh yes it is this is a great kind of be a really interesting experience so you kind of sublimate that and find oh this would be kind of interesting yeah which is a bit of rationalization as well I, it is. I, mm-hmm. yeah and then jesse asked she didn't see what was positive about the defense mechanism for the three. Oh, identification yes um well as a three would you put a spin on it you i you, i'm gonna steal your line spin it to win it you what's, did. What's, you like that, didn't you? I love you? it. I love it. <laughs> what's good about identification? Well, you know, the Jesuits, when they went to China, ah. um, they didn't wear their robes. They wore the, the clothes of the Chinese people mm-hmm. so that they weren't imposing themselves, but they were adapting mm-hmm. and identifying with that group. So you can't go in their door to bring them out yours kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it works. Uh, it, it, it And if it, you For know, if it, as, them, the, yeah. as the AA people would say, if it works, it doesn't work unless you work it. So there's something to looking at what works in order to not just be productive, but be reproductive. To, in order to have intimacy with someone, you've got, you, you need to, um, you need to uh, welcome them and, and practice spiritual hospitality in order to have real relationships. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, the other, I'm just, as we, you know, we're just making this up as we go along. It's, that's called science. Um, if you, so identification is what's going on now. If you are stuck in the past, hey, you know, things have changed and, and those things you're using uh, are not working now. It's like you, the paradigm has shifted. And so if you're thinking, uh, we really need local bookstores because that, that'll be a good thing. They don't have many books, but you know, it, it, it's a, that's a good thing. Or we should have these local stores and, and groceries and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's a good thing. Or we should open more stores up uh, you know, and, and bring people in. Well, uh, actually, if you create a really big store like Walmart, you can have a lot more products for a lot cheaper price. That's a different paradigm. If you have a behemoth like Amazon, you can have a lot, a lot, a lot of books, like lightning gram books, and you can get them really cheap. It's a new paradigm. Or instead of opening up all these stores, you can do it online. It's a new paradigm. Now you can stay in the past, but you need to start identifying with the new way of doing things, or you're going to go the way of all those mom and pop stores that when you walk down the street, they're closed. So you got to, uh, <clears throat> to that extent, identify with the c- current zeitgeist and what's working these days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So like we, well, I don't know, you're doing your training live now, I think, but I mean, I'm still online. Yeah, it's hybrid because yeah. I'm adapting. I'm identifying with what the needs are, right? And that kind of evolution to say, um, I can't, I can't live in my, uh, in my primordial ooze. I've, I've got to, you know, <laughs> anyway. Yeah, good. So, All right. Any other questions? I think that Lin, uh, Linnea saying something about black and white thinking. Did you want to unmute yourself, Linnea? Uh, I just am grateful because I think as a one, you read the list of defense mechanisms and right away decide, well, those are bad. You're defending yourself. And to hear Dr. Wagner, you explain how 
there's actually really good things in our defenses and our longing for safety and security and all those other things, power and, and approval. And, and so it's helping me to look at the defense mechanism and not immediately go, oh, shame on you. You shouldn't <laughs> be reacting for, you should, you should actually, because here's what happens to me as I'm learning my dismissed four. And I know that I shouldn't always have reaction formation because that ignores my authentic feelings and reactions. Uh-huh. Yep. No, no. Shame on you. And mm -hmm. so if I'm not careful, I'm thinking, okay, defense mechanism, bad, feel all the feelings. And then I immediately descend to this overdramatic, everybody needs to experience my four explosion. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So it's helpful to see, wow, my reaction formation has served me really well, actually. But when it's kind of like the Bill Cosby line. Here's some humor for you. Put this in your notes, Jerry. That he said, your tonsils are great until they turn their guns on you. <laughs> and then he, ah. That's when we all got our tonsils out when we were little. But I'm seeing that the same way. Like the defense mechanism mm. helps us until it doesn't help us. So that's yeah. where the wisdom will come. It's like, well, okay, what do we do with that? Or as you're talking... And, and I'm, so I'm glad I stayed around a little longer. The defense mechanisms in the service of the ego, not such a good thing. So it's an ego, uh, you know, try to bolster up the ego. But the defenses in service of the self, your essence might be a good thing. Something like that. There you go. Thanks. And I also will, you know, steal Bill Cosby's line. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's been canceled. So sorry. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. Defense is so in, in service of the ego or self. Yeah. Mm, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Michelle, who's the five, uh, yeah. I, if you will come out from behind your screen, you don't have to if you don't want to, but it would be great, Michelle, if you would say that out loud. I love, I love what you said here. Hi. Um, I, I was just thanking you, Dr. Wagner, um, because I love the way you bring so many different things together. You've got, you know, spirituality in my schema, the uh, psychologist, the popular culture quotes, the, you know, the, all the Enneagram stuff, and you just bring all these different worlds together so eloquently. And I always love listening to you, and I'm always so grateful for how you see the world and maybe as a as a five i get it <laughs> i get how you how you put things together and how you do things and you know that synthesis of of so much of the world and your wisdom to be able to synthesize so many things i just so appreciate that <laughs> thank you very much your cat does not seem to be too excited or yeah. enthused about <laughs> it. <It's> all right <laughs> Well, this has been fabulous, and you're, you're getting thank yous here in the chat, and uh, and I think all of us that want to continue learning from you are just saying, keep bringing it, keep writing those articles, and uh, and you know, and help us synthesize um, what it, you know can feel like everything is so polarized, and to have mm. this kind of synthesis is is deeply good for our souls and our ability to communicate um, and belong to each other. So, yeah. so together, everyone, you want to say thank you and, uh, and in all the ways you want to on the way out. And so we could sing, I'm so glad we had this time. I'll sing it with together. you. Yeah. Just, just to have, have a laugh. laugh. Or sing a song. Let's see if there's any other old people in here. So we just get started. And before you know it, comes the time we have to say so long. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Carol.